Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Yes. Me too. <clears throat> okay. So I actually want to start, for those of us who are very new to the subject, with a very basic question. For those who don't know, what exactly is Alzheimer's and what's the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? Because I feel like people use them interchangeably. They do. Alzheimer's is a specific brain disease. It, the, They think the cause is the plaques and the tangles messing up your... Your cognitive? Yeah, your the neurons communicating with each other. So okay. Obviously, your brain processes information differently, slower, or not at all. Mm -hmm. Dementia is actually a symptom. It's not a disease. There are over 100 dementia-causing diseases. I, don't, I do not know no, all it's of them. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't... That makes sense. So it's a symptom. Correct. And it could be a symptom of probably another disease, too, not just Alzheimer's. Dementia. Right. Vascular yeah. dementia is caused usually if you have a stroke or some... Uh, my grandmother had a brain aneurysm that leaked for three months. Wherever the blood touches the brain... Uh, is the it kills the brain so uh, <laughs> that's not a good thing yeah um there's parkinsonian dementia yeah. there's alcohol induced dementia uh what else wow. is there yeah and the cancer does cancer did you say your mom had cancer induced dementia or induced? well my mother had a brain tumor so did it's that a little different dementia yeah. was caused by that no the dementia was caused or the memory loss was caused by the brain but not tumor. technically dementia no. so dementia is, some, is something different from memory loss this is a different yeah, memory type of loss, symptom yeah it, it, memory loss is the pre, is how it's presented most often right um right. which is typical but it's not the only symptom of a potential brain disease yeah and there are memory loss situations that could not be something as scary as a dementia causing disease right like a medication um you know, obviously a tumor is not good, but there, yeah, you yeah. know, just because you're having memory loss does not mean, oh my gosh, I have Alzheimer's and right. my life is over. And like, what about like a, like your dad had a stroke that resulted that was in dementia? Vascular. Mm -hmm. That right? was vascular dementia, yeah. but Based not Alzheimer's. Correct. Correct. Okay. I'm saying correct because I know. Yeah, because we <laughs> already, we are, we already talked about the it. The three yeah. of us met a few days ago. You talked. So, okay. So when, when we are, if we have a family member, like maybe one with dementia, one with Alzheimer's, what would be the main differences that we might see characteristically? Like, does, I know I have, um, with Alzheimer's, I'm, I wrote down on here that they sometimes can forget to breathe, how to eat, mm -hmm. walk. Is that like a That's more an, Alzheimer's thing? I believe so, yes. Yeah. And that happens at the very end. Yeah. Okay. Vascular dementia has caused... Um, in most cases, like a stroke, there's a blood clot in the brain, and right. it cuts off the circulation and the oxygen to your brain. So okay, and then as far do we know if there's is there a cause a known cause? Is it hereditary? There is a gene. There's actually two genes. If you've got both of them, your risk for Alzheimer's is greatly increased. Wow. Um, I do think it's like thirty or thirty five percent. It's not huge. That might be one gene. I should have looked that up. That's okay. Um, we all will look it up now. <laughs> yeah, really. Do you know if you have it? Like, have you guys checked all your genetics? Either no, one of you? I've thought about it. Yeah. I don't um, know if I'd want to know. Yeah, I'm on the fence. It's like you, yeah. you, the earlier you know, the earlier you can take interventions and yeah. you can plan ahead financially, legally, medically, all of these charming things we all love to do. Right. And I already do all the interventions. We have a trust. My husband and my daughter know what my wishes are. So I feel like I've kind of already gone there. Right. Um, we kind of have morbid sense of humor in our family. So why Same. are we even talking about what we want to, what we want done with ourselves after yeah, we're we do gone? It all the time. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, we do. You know, I don't think everybody appreciates that. Oh, my, my dad's hospice team did. They're like, Oh, your morbid sense of humor is so refreshing. I was like, is that uh, a compliment? I'm I not think sure so, because they're probably not used to I always say I'm going to be out of here by about 65, so just plan for that. I always tell everyone. But, you know, I'm, yeah, definitely. Okay, anyways, that's a whole other subject. Um, as far as, like, lifestyle factors, just want to, these are questions I know most people have. Like, are there things that typically or have been known to lead to Alzheimer's, like lifestyle factors? 
Like, I, I yeah. believe so. I don't think modern life is healthy for our brains. Yeah, we talked about yes. Um, you know, we want to mitigate stress. We want to keep stress mm -hmm. to a minimum. Stress is toxic for yeah. your brain. I mean, kind of picture like every time you're like really stressed and uh -huh. you physically feel it, just kind of picture, you know, pouring toxic goop on your brain. Yeah. It's terrible for our yeah. bodies. Um, yeah. You know, and then we usually don't do things like eat well. We might drink too much. People partake in other things. You know, we don't sleep well because we're stressed. I mean, just it's like a I wonder snowball. like <clears throat> the effect of like with stress, like I've started learning about cortisol and like just flooding with cortisol all the time. I mean, that can't be good for your for your brain. Um, OK, so as far as being able to determine whether or not a family member may be affected, um, what are some of the early like telltale signs of symptoms of Alzheimer's to look for? I mean, I think we all think forgetfulness. Um, but if there's if like. Like say my mom, my mom is perfectly healthy and fine right now, but say I'm, I'm starting to notice a few things. I'm getting concerned. What would be some of the things that I'd want to look for? Well, there are 10 warning signs. Okay. The Alzheimer's Association has them on their website. And uh -huh. so I just pulled them up because one of these days I will memorize them. Yeah. It's actually one of the curriculums. <laughs> it's 10 that is a lot. Yeah. yeah. Um, I also like to make sure I get it exactly yeah. right. Yeah. The So the 10 warning signs is actually a curriculum that I'll be teaching as a community educator. So oh, good. I will be learning. These. That's awesome. OK. <laughs> I do know most of them, but I do like to, I guess it's state it perfectly. Mm -hmm. um, so you have memory loss that disrupts daily life. OK. And I do think my mom had that a little bit as we discussed. Um, mm -hmm. in During our, the pre-interview. Yeah. Yeah. So for your listeners, we had a family business together. My mom started taking orders from clients with no due dates, no information, the client would show up and you'd be like, oh, he, 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 sorry, it's not done. Uh -huh. And of course, it'd be my mom's day off. And it was really easy to say, oh, well, you know, the phone rang, the doorbell rang, she had to pee, whatever, yeah. all of the above. Very easy to dismiss. So yeah. the second warning sign is challenges in planning or solving problems. Mm. And so that's, I think that one can show up in a lot of different ways. Some of it affects people's careers, how they're, you know, working or, you know, sometimes, you know, like. For me, I order groceries, so I go and I look, okay, what's the temperature going to be this next week? What sounds good to eat? And I plan meals and I order the food. That's not a complicated task, mm -hmm. but it's there's quite a lot of steps. There's a lot of thought processes. So if I started having trouble with that, I think that would be a warning sign to my okay. husband. Um, difficulty completing familiar tasks. That was obviously my mom had, mm. you know, like mm -hmm. writing the date, you know, mm -hmm. when the client was going to pick up their order. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Little details like that. Um, confusion with time or place. I'm going to circle back because I know you have something to say, but I'll circle back to you. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, new problems with words in speaking or writing. So if you, a lot of times people struggle to find a word and that's very normal, but mm -hmm. if that happens more and more, you know, they're, or they use the word incorrectly or they use the wrong word. Oh, okay. These are kind of all signs. And, of course, they're all easily dismissed as to, you mm -hmm. know. Aging. To, yeah. yeah. Um, we can talk about aging because your mom made a comment the other day that wasn't right. And I never got to circle back to oh, that. Oh, we definitely <laughs> will. Please. <laughs> <laughs> it's one everybody makes, so don't worry about it. Um, so then we have misplacing things and and losing the ability to retrace your steps. Mm -hmm. So I am super, super organized, like hyper organized. Everything has a place. Everything goes in its place. So if I can't find something and I retrace my steps and I can't find it, I usually know my husband moved it. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> if you can't, if do, you can't that, do that, you know, you, you lose that ability to backtrack through time. That's yeah. definitely a warning yeah. sign. Yeah. Um, and then we have withdrawal from work or social activities. Mm -hmm. This is also um, something that happens if people don't hear well, which is, makes it really important if you start noticing like hearing problems is to get the hearing checked and I hope I don't ever have to wear hearing aids because I don't understand why people fight that so hard. Uh, you can ask my mom because uh, yeah. she's sitting right next <laughs> to you. I'm just going to pick uh... on you today. <laughs> and then, no, it's okay. And I've then made the just doctor started. appointment. It just so. started. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and then we have changes in mood and personality. Yeah. So, okay. You know, yeah. That's a, yeah. What, yeah, I think that's the one, just real quick, I want to say the changes in mood and personality is the one I think that can be, I mean, all of them could be disturbing, but that's the one it's like, who are you? I don't know. Like the adult child to the person who has Alzheimer's, they become almost recognizable because like, as you said, and when we were talking in the pre-interview, your dad was 
acting in ways he'd never acted. And it's almost like, who, who is this person? And it's, it's something else takes over and they can become somebody that we're not used to. Combative. Com yeah. He not in that combative. case. Yeah. yeah. But what were you going to say? I know, I know you have some experience with this, with getting lost and not knowing where you are. My sister and I traveled from a trip and she didn't, I made sure she traveled from her home in Orange County to Sacramento. Then we traveled together to our destination, back to Sacramento. So when we got back in Sacramento and we went to my house, and she lives in Orange County, she goes, I don't understand. I'm home. Why can't my husband come and pick me up? Mm. So to me, that was very sad. Oh, that's very and sad. And I immediately made up to her, because she had a reservation for later that afternoon, but I made it sooner so I could get her home because I could tell she needed She was to maybe there. going downhill. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Or maybe she was, and we're going to get to masking, but it could be that she was holding, you know, and then she was starting, yeah. But she, she's, I think, comfortable with me, mm -hmm. but... Where she could ask that. She wouldn't say that to anybody else. Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. It, that's a, that's yeah. interesting that she would know better than not to, like, maybe say mm -hmm. it and, and possibly feel embarrassed. Embarrassed if, yeah. yourself, yeah. yeah. Once it's determined that a loved one does have Alzheimer's, what are some of the common mistakes that you see family members or caregivers make that, that tend to make things um, worse instead of better? I think our first instinct is... You know, we have to fix it. We have what do we what do we need to do? We kind of go into fix, repair, panic mode, and we forget that they still have lots of abilities. Yeah. And the longer we help them maintain their whatever abilities they have, their independence, the better it is for everybody. Because mm. you don't want them to get into the middle and the later stages where you can't leave them home alone or they right. need to be fed or you know, you have to do pretty much everything from you don't want to hurry up into this those yeah, stages yeah and those you know and it's very you know it's hard for them i mean mm -hmm. i don't i cannot imagine what it's like knowing that your memory is going to fail you your brain is going to fail you i mean eventually you get to the point where you don't know that right. and i think that's a blessing but in the earlier stages that must be traumatic very and, and here's okay. your yes. you know your your kid you know, yeah, she might be an adult, but she's still the kid yeah. or whatever. Or even your spouse. And they're like, well, let me take care of that. And let me do that. First off, you're going to burn yourself out. And then you're going to you're going to very likely expedite the progression mm. of their disease. Yeah. That is so important to know, I feel like. You also something that I my mom, like, again, I need to make it very clear. She does not have Alzheimer's or dementia, but I like to, I'm, you know, I'm here. Obviously, it runs. We have it in our family. And um you know, I want to be prepared and I just want her to, because she's currently dealing with it with a family member not dealing with it. You're observe. Yeah. I'm on the outside Is there looking a in. Better way to say that. Time. Yeah. Um, we've talked about like how it's not great to quiz them or correct them because I mean, I know with her again, she doesn't have this, but when she gets forget like this morning, <laughs> like I sent you a text, remember the video I sent you this mm -hmm. morning? of I need to go see like a dermatologist for a skin thing. We have skin cancer that runs in our family, different story for another day. But I sent her a video and she, and and I'm just like, don't you know that you have to like, whatever. So I like get frustrated that um, she's doesn't know to like turn up the video of the volume and like whatever, press play and whatever. And so I imagine that when they are making silly mistakes like that, it can, it can cause us to become, fr or maybe people are more patient than I am. That could be true. <laughs> in, in my defense, I always have my phone silent. I'd never have the volume up ever. Why? Because I, I like the quiet. Okay. And I will read the text. Oh, from now on, I will give you very so, yeah, clear instructions. Yeah, more specific okay. next time, honey. Anyways, I think I get frustrated because I'm like, why don't you know this? Is your memory slipping? And I get like, I think it's almost a fear response. Mm -hmm. And you want to correct them. Like, no, you know this kind of thing. And um, <laughs> But you're saying, you were saying like, it's don't quiz them, don't correct them. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, if I'm, you're sitting there, your mom's laughing. She's explaining why <laughs> her, her. But somebody with Alzheimer's, like, does it make them feel attacked? Yeah. 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 I mean, you would you say, you know, it's very common. Well, can't you remember? Don't you remember? Mm -hmm. We just talked. No, mm -hmm. they don't remember. Mm -hmm. Your brain doesn't work right. And 
in the earlier stages, that's really hard to deal with because, you know, they kind of look and act normal or the way they used to be. And, you know, my dad was terrible. You know, he'd, my mom would ask a question, he'd answer it. She'd ask it again and he'd just snap a response and then she'd be nasty. And then and yeah. like, yeah, you know, and okay, oh, so now we got stress going on. And, you know, do we think very well when we're stressed? No. no. Or when we're angry, we make logical decisions. <laughs> right. So, you know, you're just challenging them and their brain is already moving slower. I like to correlate it to like an old computer. You can mm. fire it up. You can ask it to pull up some, you know, documents and it does it, but it takes its sweet time. Right. And that's kind of how the brain is. It's really slowing down. And um, but it's yeah. but then it's got a virus that's screwed it mm. all up, too. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. I'll be nicer, Mom. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> OK. So I'm, I'm going to read this verbatim because I wrote it down very stream of consciousness when I was writing my outline. I would imagine if I was my mom's caregiver and she had Alzheimer's that I might have some frustration. Like I said, initially feeling like maybe I was losing my mom and why can't she be mm -hmm. who she was? Because essentially what it sounds like is the parent is becoming the child and the child has to be the parent. And I'd imagine that could be a difficult pill to swallow, especially if your parent has always been like your rock or your go-to person. And to piggyback on that, um, you talked a little bit about how sometimes as the disease progresses, they begin and they begin requiring more help. Like you mentioned about your dad, the more combative they can be. And um, I, th my thought is when you have a parent like I do, my mom here who is super mild-mannered and controlled, that could be pretty alarming in navigating um, those outbursts that are so foreign to who they've always been. Um, it, how come, I mean, I sound like a terrible daughter. I'm really not. But it, how common is that? Are most people... Um, do most people, is it instinct to know how to handle a parent who is suffering with something like Alzheimer's? I think absolutely not. Yeah. A lot of people relate it to raising children, and it's similar, but not at all. Like mm -hmm. Children learn, grow, and become more independent, and the reverse happens with somebody that's got a dementia-causing disease. And it sucks up more and more and more of your time and your life and, every, you know— like mm -hmm. I said, my mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years. 20 years, yeah. Um, you know, she was, my dad did most of the caregiving. He didn't let us help, and which was dumb. Yeah. Because it's exhausting. You know, when you, they have to stop driving, and that's a challenge getting people out of their cars. We have a very mm -hmm. car-centric, especially here in California, can't mm -hmm. get anywhere without a mm -hmm. car. Yeah. <laughs> you know, getting them out, that's giving up your independence. You know, there's a lot of challenges with that, and it's just... And then everybody's everybody's different. Everybody's brains are different. And the disease affects everybody differently. So there's not like, okay, here's the blueprint of how to take care of somebody with Alzheimer's mm -hmm. or vascular dementia or whatever the other 100 plus yeah. dis dementia causing diseases. So it feels like every caregiver, whether it's a spouse or a child or whomever, has to recreate the wheel. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the most important thing is if you... If they've got a diagnosis or even if you suspect is to just get educated. And that's much easier these days than it was when my mom first started showing signs. You didn't talk about it. I didn't even actually learn about the Alzheimer's Association until after my dad died. So my dad died in March of 2017. Mm -hmm. I went to one bereavement support group through the hospice company that we had used. And it was like, well, this is kind of helpful for dealing with how I feel about losing my dad but I got this giant other problem over here. Yeah. And so I'm like, this this group is not what I need. Mm -hmm. um, so I Googled like people do. And that's when I found the support groups through the Alzheimer's Association. And that's a whole other podcast yeah. episode, how I became a professional volunteer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the more you know, they have the so there's lots of ways to learn. There's a lot of people sharing on social media. They share their daily life. I have, you know, mixed emotions on those. Yeah. I think it's good that they're sharing but they're sharing their experience mm. and they, you know, there's people, there's one particular gal caring for a parent and this parent, very compliant, mm. very compliant. And that's not necessarily always the case. I'm assuming. <laughs> if, if the care to giving daughter asked the questions of my mom that they ask of their parent, my mom would have said, what was my mom's phrase? 
my mom had a phrase that basically was her equivalent of F you. Wow. <laughs> and oh so when I God. see her, I, I quiz her on this and she never corrects her. So she'll ask her to spell something or read something or do something. And they never correct. They never say, oh, you're wrong. They just go with whatever the answer is. So that's okay. But the quizzing, my mom would have said, oh, oh, do, go drop dead. That was my mom's. <laughs> that was my mom's version of. Yeah, because it maybe feels patronizing or like, you know, when you're quizzing. Probably. Yeah, when your child's and quizzing. What they're doing is they're kind of assessing where she's at. Right. Which, okay, great. I get that. I don't disagree with that. But it's like, I'm not sure my mom would not have punched them in the face. Yeah. So, wow. you know, so you got to be very careful what you see on social media because they're sharing their their journey with their person, mm -hmm. which was not at all like my journey with my mom. And it's not like this other person over here. Mm -hmm. So you can go to the Alzheimer's Association has tons of online and in-person training. The support groups are great. The support group that I facilitate. Those people are fantastic. All I basically got to do is open the Zoom window. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, they could do that themselves. They really don't need me. And they help each other, That's which awesome. is great. That's Occasionally, awesome. they'll ask questions. A lot of them, their loved ones have moved into memory care, and they know my mom. I had that experience with my mom. So they're, you know, they're in the early stages of memory <laughs> care. Oops. And, you know, I've, I did it for three years with my mom. So it was like, okay. Yeah. You know, that's where I come in to help. But yeah. yeah, it's not instinctive to know how to take care of them. It's sad. It's terrifying. It's confusing. It disrupts your life. Yeah. I mean, it's like, mm. you know, it's funny is um, two things come to mind. One is I heard a quote recently that said a, mo a mom can um, a mom can take care of 10 kids, but 10 kids can't take care of a mom. Me Because, yeah, um, because it's always like, well, who's going to look after mom and who's going to do this? And you see that happen so much. And another in th another thing that you mentioned was um, that you know, different from kids, um, parents that are going through this, they get worse and worse and worse instead of, you know, more and more independent, they get more and more dependent. Um, and the third thing I wanted to mention was, um, that when we, when people share online about their loved ones with Alzheimer's and don't expect that to be everybody's reality, it's the same thing as, as, um, parenting when people talk about their parenting, like this should work for everybody. Well, <laughs> one size does not fit all, fits all with kids either. So... Um, okay, so something I've heard you mention a few times online, what is the notion of living in their world or their reality? What is What does that mean and how does someone do that? This is a question I wish somebody had answered way back when with yeah. me because I actually really learned this close to the end of my mom's life and I've really, it's been cemented since she's passed. Yeah. What most people don't get, they might be, you know, their brain might be in that loop of, where they were 20, 30, 40 years ago. And it's kind of impossible to tell. So when they make a comment and you're thinking like, you know, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> Just go with Just it. Just go with it. Because you're not going to reorient them to it's, you know, such and such a day at such and such time. In the early stages, you might be able to. There's a lot of clocks and calendars. Like There's a big clock that'll say the day, the date, the month, and the time, like in big bold letters. So like you can look at it and it kind of helps, but eventually those things don't happen. So my favorite story with my mom, when I finally started getting into her reality, mm -hmm. um, cause I really didn't understand that it meant we might not be in whatever year we're in yeah. or where we are. It might be completely different is I showed up to visit with her and she started talking to me and she goes, well, my brothers are normal people now. And fortunately, that struck me funny. What does that mean? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't even know why she was thinking about her brother. So she goes, well, my brothers are normal people now. And I'm like, oh, really? You think so? I'm like, well, I think Stephen might be normal, but I don't think, I don't know about Richard. And she laughed. And mm -hmm. then that conversation was over and we started talking about something like the tree. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, Okay. and the other thing, it took me a little while to figure out. So she thought I was her best friend. It is very common for your person to forget the specific relationship, right. daughter, spouse, brother, sister, whatever. And hey, best friend is kind of an upgrade, right? <laughs> yeah. And so in the beginning, when I would go visit her, I would always take her out of memory care, take her to the nail salon or whatever. 
And she would ask, and she, this shows you what kind of relationship my parents had. She'd be like, does my husband know where we're going? <laughs> <clears throat> yes, mom. Dad knows where we're going. Now, did I answer her question? Yes. Mm-mm. Wait. She said, did her husband know where she was going? Oh. And I said, yes, mom. Oh. Dad knows where we're going. She probably had no clue who was I'm like, why does this chick call me mom? She probably thought I was nuts. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so this one particular day, I love this story. Her room was on the opposite side of the building from the parking lot. So I get, you know, tell her, I don't remember where we were going. So we go. She asked me like five times before we get out of the building, does my husband know where we're going? And it was always in that snarky tone of voice, which just mm-hmm. kind of grated on your nerves. But the fact that it's like I have to pretend that my dad is not dead and I have mm-hmm. to pretend he's her husband, which I mean, he was. Oh, but, he was passed by the yeah. Oh, um, yeah. So we get out to the car. I open the car to help her in because at this point, her visual processing is bad. And I have black leather seats in my car, which can be interpreted as a whole. Mm-hmm. Or, um, you know, like you're not going to go sit on something black and whole, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> gets challenging. But you also aren't super confident. Like when you when you get in the car after we're done, you don't look and maneuver. You just get in. Yeah. And when you lose that ability, it's like you want to be able to see where you're going to sit. And that's very difficult. Oh. So there was always a little shuffling to get in the car. And well, my husband know where we're going. Oh. Oh. At this point, I'm, like, I'm going to shove this woman oh, in the trunk. Oh, my gosh. I don't think I can do this. I'm losing my mind. And I'm like, okay, it's okay. It'll be fine. I walk around the car. I put my hand on the door handle. I swear to God, a bolt of lightning hit my brain. I'm like, I have not answered her question. Oh. So when I got in the car, she said, does my husband know where we're going? Yes. I saw him at the meeting. He knows I'm taking you to the nail salon. Did not ask again the rest of the day. Oh. I was like, well, why didn't I know that sooner? So one of the stories I like mm. to tell is not, not mine. I have a past guest. Her name is Helene Berger. She wrote a book called... The Joy of Alzheimer's, I believe. It's got a big sunflower on mm-hmm. it. I usually show my audience the book because I have an Andy, but I didn't bring my whole library today. Her husband was very loving, mild manner, sweet. And he would repeat the question. And of course, I mean, we all have kids. So it's like when they're four and they're like, why, why, yeah. why? Yeah. And you just want to be like, this is yeah. why. Yeah. <laughs> Shut up. Mm-hmm. It just gets on your nerves. Mm-hmm. Well, like a four-year-old, you can kind of Maybe mm-hmm. shove them off to dad or engage them in something else. But when, the, you know, your spouse or your parent is asking the same question over and over, it just like mm-hmm. makes you insane. Mm-hmm. And she rolled her eyes and sighed, looked at him and the expression on his face. She said it looked like I had slapped him. And she said, I vowed right then and there I'm never going to do anything to put that look on his face again. And she developed this mantra, which is actually um, one way that. The Alzheimer's Association has trained people to deal with repetitive behavior Mm -hmm. is to take a deep breath and remind yourself, you know, center yourself a little bit. And what she did was she would remind herself that if he could remember the answer, he would not ask. And he did not ask to have Alzheimer's. And she just made that her mantra. Mm -hmm. And I think just that little, what was that, 10 seconds? Mm -hmm. Just it like eased the frustration so that she never made him feel like he's been slapped. Wow. That is, that's good. You can imagine how she felt. Yeah. It's like, you know, she just, yeah. she was tired. She didn't want to hear the same question again. And Yeah. You know, she looked like she, he looked like she'd smacked him upside the head. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's hard for everyone. It's hard for the caregiver. So, you know, I, I have, <clears throat> I have a condition that I left, I was disabled for a few years. And I remember always saying, I don't know who has it worse, myself or my husband. Because it's hard for me. Yes, obviously, my life has grinded to a halt and whatever. But so it's kind of, so it's his, you know. So it's hard for both. And I think that, you know, yeah, I think we can forget in the midst of it being hard that they're the ones that are living with this, Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, One of the things that struck me during the pre-interview was the number of years that your mom lived following her diagnosis. So 20 years, as we've said. Um, Your dad lived for 15. And if... I'll just speak for myself. If, if I was to hear that one of my parents had Alzheimer's, I think I would assume that like the life was going to grind to a halt, that it was, you know, we were living on borrowed time, so to speak. Um, But it doesn't sound like that's always the case. So is there, 
The first question, is there a trajectory that appears to be most common following a diagnosis? And are there factors that can influence the rate of the decline? So either um, speed it up or slow it down. Like what's typical or what do you see Not most sure often? There is a typical. There is. So it seems that people who have younger onset Alzheimer's, which is diagnosed before age 65, mm-hmm. have a tendency to progress faster. Uh huh. But that's not necessarily all the time. It's just kind of that's what they see. One interesting thing is people who are like really highly intelligent, very accomplished, like engineers, that kind of brain thought Mm -hmm. process, like the whole opposite of mine. Yeah, same. (laughs) Have enough mental reserves and like tips and tricks like they can pull from different spots to kind of compensate for like, you know, like if I broke my collarbone in 2016 Thankfully, it was my left hand. and I'm right-handed. <laughs> oh, God. Um, and you you compensate while it's healing. Well, they can do the same thing until they run out of those reserves. So oh. somebody with the super high intelligence level might look like their progression is really fast because they've been dealing with it like in the background for mm-hmm. a long time. And then all of a sudden, they run out of coping techniques and it's just downhill. That makes sense. So yeah. the... The progression, I don't know if there's anything that would speed it up other than doing more damage to your brain, like traumatic brain injury mm-hmm. or a stroke. Like you've got Alzheimer's and you have a stroke, that's that's got to be really yeah. bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. I don't even want to think about that. But there are things, there's lifestyle interventions that is highly recommended. And it goes back to the whole thing. I don't think modern life is good for us. Yeah. <laughs> is, you know, we want to eat as healthy as possible I know caregivers who have put their loved one on a vegan diet. Mm-hmm. I can't go that far. Mm-hmm. Um, and they thrive. Like, so, like, my mom was super physically healthy. There's nothing wrong with her except Alzheimer's disease, mm. which is, you know, unfortunate. So, so unfortunate. And because she was younger, you know, we kind of had to wait either for the disease to progress or age to progress or both. And it was mostly the disease um, that took her out. But I really am beginning to think that we have animals in like corporate agricultural farms you know obviously if you've got a sister in orange county you've driven past harris ranch which is yuck Mm -hmm. um you know so they're stressed so their stress hormone is is increased Mm -hmm. and then we eat them and we have high stress Mm -hmm. levels because modern Mm -hmm. life i'm like you know i'm not giving up meat but Mm -hmm. for you know i've eaten a lot less of it lately and i feel better so I think it's interesting. Yeah. So they, the lifestyle interventions are basically you know, all the things we love to hear. Eat healthy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get good sleep. Mitigate your stress. Don't drink. Yeah. A lot of doctors won't tell. They'll tell you to re- limit your alcohol. There really is no level of alcohol that is not detrimental to your brain. If uh-huh. you think about what alcohol does to you, it's not exactly a right. high a high medical concept to grasp. Um, well, that's kind of sad. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I figure in moderation. So we're eating right. We're sleeping good. We're mitigating our stress. We're exercising. We're mm. keeping our weight in a, you know, reasonable because you want to keep inflammation. They think inflammation is the cause of a lot of our chronic diseases like mm. MS and Parkinson's mm. and Alzheimer's. And you also talked about a little bit about how they uh, people with Alzheimer's, they thrive well on, on routine. Mm hmm. How important is that? What the role of having a routine? Like, is it, um, does it make a big difference on, yeah. yeah. I mean, think about your, someone knows what to expect, I guess. Think about your week. Yeah. Like Monday, you, you have a routine. Yeah. And when it gets thrown off for whatever, daylight savings, the kids are out of school, you yeah. know, you're going on vacation, so you're doubling down on work or you're home from vacation and there's 5,000 more pounds of laundry to do. What, you know, it's like whatever your routine. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But we cope. We're, we're good. Right. You know, or you think about toddlers who don't have the, they haven't developed into the coping techniques of of dealing with twists and turns of life, which of course is normal. Um, again, I had a really interesting guest. He wrote a book called Running All Over the World. So this particular guest, his name is Tony Parker. And he, Tony Copeland Parker? Copeland. That's Parker Copeland, mm-hmm. one of those two. I mm-hmm. always get the two last names mixed up. He was a uh, flight uh, pilot for UPS. Mm-hmm. He ended up with a heart issue, got um, basically grounded. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, his partner, Kat, was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. And they said, heck with it. They sold their condo, put all their belongings in storage, 
and literally went all over the world doing marathons. That's what they love to do. So they and I asked him that. I'm like, didn't she wake up thinking, where the hell am I? And he said, you know, yeah, she had confusion at the video, but that's kind of how it always was. They mm -hmm. had a routine, even though every day was different. Yeah. So it worked for them. Wow, that's amazing. Yep. Um, okay, so I want to switch gears a bit, talk and talk a little bit about care and housing. Something um, something interesting that you brought up to us was that only 10% of homes are designed for in-place care. So depending on the person, I'd imagine some families would choose to move their loved one into their home or like maybe an in-law's quarter. Um, but you also mentioned memory care facilities and assisted living. And I was curious, what are the main differences in the considerations? I mean, obviously we know with in-home care, but especially with the two, um, assisted living and memory care, what are the main differences and considerations of those? Well, there's usually three or four levels when you move into like a senior community. Uh -huh. um, there's independent living where you said is pretty much what it sounds like. It's like support. I kind of think it's like a lot like living in a dorm where, you know, you're free to come and go and do what you need to do, but there's always like a, like a backstop there in case you have an emergency or okay. something, you know, you're not running to your neighbor in the middle of the night going, Oh my gosh, you know, my person fell or whatever. So there's, there's like supports in the background if you need them. And then assisted living is similar. You're still independent, but there's there's more support. There's more help. Um, and then I guess you go to memory care, which is generally um, a locked facility so that they can't roam away. Mm. And it's the people there there to take care of your per your loved one or yeah. you, whomever. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's basically different. You have a, there's like a built-in caregiver, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in terms of the level of care that they receive, what should we expect from a care facility? And are there considerations that we need to understand up front when determining? Because obviously the way we think they should be taken care of or how we would take care of them, you, we talked about this a little bit. You can't always assume or expect that of the facility. What have you heard about that? Well, what unfortunately, do you know? this got, has gotten worse since covid most caregivers in memory care are not paid very well, and they're also not trained very well. They're super highly compassionate people that care. Um, not all of us are capable of taking care of a spouse or a parent. There's a lot mm -hmm. of people that are still raising children, and now mom needs help, and you're trying to maintain your career. I mean, like, there's only so many balls. Oh, one gosh, of them. I can't even imagine. Yeah, no, I, I can't. <sighs> I mean, my daughter had just moved out when my dad died, mm -hmm. and I basically had to tell her, I'm like, until... You know, I'm I'm in charge of your grandmother now. Like, right. don't don't think you're come bouncing back. Right, <laughs> you're right. on your own. Yeah, he's <laughs> like, if you need help, well, you're gonna have to wait. You know, your grandmother's coming. The way first. that's timed it is an interesting. Right as our kids leave us, our parents start. <laughs> well, what was not my mom though? <laughs> I'm just kidding. What was it? Well, my daughter was 25, so it was yeah. time. Oh but, yeah, okay. You know, yeah, the modern life is different than when we were younger. Yeah, but um, my dad always assumed that my mom would move in with me. Mm -hmm. But we never had that conversation. Mm. Thanks, Dad. Still, <laughs> still kind of pissed off about that one. How, how seven years later? Yeah. Well, so we, my mom would be with me for a few days, and then my sister for a few days, and then her sister would be in their home to take care of my mom. And it became very obvious that my mom instinctively remembered she was mom, mm. even though she thought I was her best friend. Mm -hmm. And there was no way. I, I told people in a week, one or both of us would be dead. Ooh, so. Yeah. When our first plan, my sister and I, who agree on nothing, when our first and only plan for care for mom fell apart, I had already started looking at memory care, and it was cheaper than in-home care. Okay. Um, but it wasn't what mom wanted, so that was a really hard decision. Yeah. Um, but my mom thrived. She had friends. That's what I would think. The social aspect of it is probably, mm -hmm. I mean, that's. I think that's what I'd want. But but do most people want to be with living with family members? As oh no! Cook. My mom always said, "I'm going to live in my home until I die, and I don't want to be a burden to you girls." Mm. Yes. Like, hello. Mm -hmm. Does anybody recognize that those are mutually exclusive? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know, I mean, I thought about like, well, because our childhood home was paid for. Um, they bought it in 1970. This was 2017, and so it was paid off. Yeah. Um, but there's still expenses. You know, heat, PG&E, water, taxes, and you know, I'm like, I don't know. 
And I knew if she moved in with me, we'd need a caregiver to yeah. manage her during the day so yeah. that we could continue on with our careers. And I knew I'd have to fight with my sister. So it's like family dynamics really start messing with the whole thing. That's like right. the more kids there are, it still lands on like the oldest daughter. Mm-hmm. It's really, really typical. Do a lot of fam- do a lot of um, adult children like take turns? I think we talked about this a bit. Like I might have my parent for a week and then my brother would have the parent. You know what I mean? Like take turns. Um, I'm not familiar with a lot of people that do okay. that. But I think it's not a bad idea if you have the space in your home. Yeah. You know, we're not building. Well, it's getting better, but we're not building multi-generational homes like yeah. we need. You know, most places don't have. Um, like a little know. in-law quarters. Yeah. That would be so helpful. It I would. Like. Totally. Like, you know, there's so many things to consider. Mm. You know, when we. It's a lot easier to baby proof a house than it is to parent proof a house. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's saying something. <laughs> and, you know. Adults can do yeah. things that yeah. small, tiny people can't. It's very true. And then they're losing their cognitive abilities. So now they're more like a toddler, but they're the, a full-sized adult with uh-huh. the experience. Of, uh-huh. It's and people Like the don't, dexterities and to be able to walk. And yeah, the whole thing, yeah. Well, and just get into things like, you know, I'm sure your mom has cooked for years and years and years. And mm-hmm. so she you know, might go in the kitchen to... Decide to make, yep. And then leave the stove on and catch something on fire. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, when someone decides to move their loved one into a care facility, um, we talked a little bit about this, how sometimes there's an adjustment period and you have to like maybe stay away for a week or two. Um, is that because they will often ask to go home? And like, what, what do you see most often in those situations? What's interesting and the reason we had this conversation is there was there's been some chatter on social media about avoiding memory care residences that tell the family they have to stay away for two or three or four weeks or whatever. And it just so happened that I recorded an episode with um, a gentleman named Max Sherman. He instinct he he and his wife have known each other since they were fifteen and seventeen. So his book, Releasing the Butterfly is basically their love story in four four acts is Mm -hmm. how it's subtitled. And as her disease progressed and their age progressed, he knew that he needed to move them to assisted living so that if something happened to him, they would have a built-in backstop. It would have built-in care for her, Mm -hmm. and it wouldn't be an emergency on top of an emergency. Mm -hmm. Well, that proved to be a very smart decision because he fell and shattered his femur. Oh, wow. And their children moved mom into the memory care that was attached to the assisted living community. And they told him not to come see her for, I don't know, like a month or more. Mm. I'd have to reference the book. That seems like a long time. I remember when I was reading the book, I was, I mean, like, I was just sitting there with my mouth open. I was just, this is horrible. You know, I can't believe he put up with that, blah, blah, blah. It's just like my brain was just all negative. And so when we were recording, I specifically asked him about that because mm-hmm. there'd been all this chatter about how it's bad. It's bad. It's bad. It's bad. And it, you know, I would be a little suspicious if they didn't want me coming around and be like, mm, I don't know about this. I might be like peering in the windows right, or something. Right. You know? What are you it's trying like, to hide? Yeah. yeah. I was like, I, I wasn't comfortable with that. But they, Max and his wife had such a routine that they'd had for, I don't know how they were when they got married, but let's say 40 years, 50 years it's a long time to have a partnership where you basically are supporting each other and everything they did. You'd have to read the book to understand their relationship was it was very more typical for a modern relationship. Very not typical for one that was started in the 50s, mm-hmm. early 50s. And they they basically told him you need to stay away so that she acclimates. Mm-hmm. And he would call her and talk to her on the phone in the morning, and the evening. And then he would go and like have a meal with her. And it was very prescribed how they kind of reintroduced him to her new reality. Okay. And he said, oh, no, absolutely. It was it was necessary. Oh, okay. And if you watch the YouTube video of it, I'm probably sitting there going, <laughs> probably wow. sitting there with my mouth. Because I, I did not expect that as an answer. I no. Re- I thought he. Hard. Yeah. And he said it was hard, but he said it was very, very necessary. It was the best thing for her. It's kind of like. You know, what when we are making decisions for our kids that sound like things that are just don't feel necessarily good. It's like 
I'm not comparing this is not disparate, right. but sometimes what's best for them is the hardest. Well, you could kind of think like I only have one. She never lived in the dorm. You know, you could almost picture like if I was one of those helicopter parents and she moved in the dorm and I'm showing up like, here's some food, honey, or I brought you these baked goods or do you need somebody to do your laundry and be like, go away. Right. Like you can't right. adapt to your new living situation if your mom's over there. It's so true. You know, and it's kind it's of the so same true. thing. And I never thought about that. And so I I only visited my mom once a week, which might sound really terrible, but I still work. I don't think so. Um, well, when I first started doing it, I was going for like two and three and four hours. Yeah. Uh, it was exhausting. And there was one day I was with her for like two-ish hours, a little more than two hours. And I had the nerve to use the ladies' room. Mm -hmm. And when I came back, she was like, oh, hi, what are you doing here? And oh, I was gosh. like, oh, crap. Now my visit, like the clock just went back to zero. Yeah. And so I learned. And I had guests that kept telling me, you need to go more often and for less time. And when oh. I finally started doing like very one-hour short, just her and I visits, they were so much better. Oh, interesting. Like, and that was, you know, probably three months before she died. So sometimes I'm a slow more, learner. More often, less time. Yeah, that's... But I went once a week and Max and I actually talked in that episode. I'm like, I wonder if that actually helped her acclimate faster. It did take six weeks and mm -hmm. it was hell those mm -hmm. first six weeks. Mm -hmm. um, was it? But yeah, she, you would, well, I went with my daughter and my paternal grandmother. And so it was the three of us. I knock on my mom's door. She opens the door. <gasps> oh, oh, no. No. You're scaring all of our listeners. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> this is why visiting after a month might not be a bad idea. Yeah, well, that's what I'm starting to think. Yeah. Um, and I was expect, and I had warned them, but it was so traumatic they never went back. Yeah. My oh, daughter shoot. would do things with my mom at her my home, but she never went back to memory care. Um, yeah, I, I was, hate comparing them. I hate comparing grown adults with Alzheimer's to toddlers. It, it, that, I, I don't like doing that, but it sounds to me very similar like when you drop your child off at like preschool or whatever, and then you pick them up and they're crying and the teacher's like, they were great all day. Mm -hmm. Like, um, Yeah, it's almost like they've been distracted, they've been doing good, and then they see you and they're reminded, oh yeah, I'm not with you. Yep. Yeah. My daughter did that. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> gosh. And no, oh, I waited uh, two Two, nine weeks, I think it I don't remember the exact week, nine weeks to go visit my son who moved to co off to college, San Diego County. And it was so, so hard for me. But, and then he was away for two years, um, lived down there for two years. And it was very, very hard for me, but so, so necessary. So I just have to say that. So something you mentioned during the pre-interview was the concept of masking, which I think we mentioned really quickly um, earlier. And you described situations when someone with Alzheimer's may have like good, solid social graces tempor temporarily, but the mask starts to slip after a while. Can you um, explain that a little bit? Yeah, they're just really good. You know, say mom's living with you or you're the one that's dealing with mom the most often. You take them to the doctor and you're like, hey, doctor, mom's doing this, this and this. And they start talking to your mom. And then you can kind of see the side eye and the doctor's like looking at you like, I don't know what her problem is. Her mom is fine. <laughs> It's very common because they just seem to have like this well of social graces right. that, where they can just pretend that everything is fine and they can fake it. And it's and when you, you don't know somebody very well or you haven't don't see them very often, mm -hmm. you miss the faking it because mm -hmm. you're not necessarily looking for it. And they do that with friends. They'll do that with, you know, sometimes they do it with other kids. You're taking care of mom. You're telling your brother, hey. You know, mom's doing this and that. I'm like, well, I'm, we, I think we're going to have to consider blah, blah, blah. And, you know, he takes mom to lunch. Mom's, you know, perfectly lovely. And yeah. You're obviously the one with the problem. Right, right. <laughs> and it's really frustrating because you're saying, hey, I'm seeing these things and I need help or I need advice or whatever. Like, we need to move on to this next stage with mom. And people are like, Pfft. I so think you're nuts. I think it's, I don't think that's a concept that most people know. I've never heard of masking, but it's important to understand that if you're on like the periphery and not really on the inside to understand, like when I'm around my aunt, her, her older sister, she seems exactly the same. I would never guess that she has Alzheimer's. Now she has spent lots of time with her. So she sees things I don't see, but it's not that obvious, you know, not always that obvious in those, especially I think those first beginning stages, because um, they are able to keep up with, I think maybe they instinctively know, 
like hold it together. I don't. Yeah, I think there's. Well, you don't want to embarrass yourself, but right. embarrass yourself. You've got, you know, and it's you know the person well enough, mm-hmm. or you know, this is going to sound terrible. Doctors' visits are a little superficial, even yeah. though they really aren't. Yeah, but the questions are like, you know, how are you feeling? Well, do you think there's something wrong with your memory? And of course, they're going to say no. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. even if you know there's something wrong, you don't really want to say yes. Especially they're just going through the motions. Yeah. Not, it's, yeah. you know, like think about if you go to a party that you're like, yeah, you don't really want to go to, but, you know, mm-hmm. it's your friend, it's their birthday, you know, yeah. you really should go. Yeah. You know, so you you go and you make nice and then you go home and you're like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Like, okay, I did that. Yeah, check. Yeah. I, I, I was the good friend today. <laughs> yeah, I did uh, what I was supposed to do. You no. Know, or, you know, you're like, how are you in a job interview? Like, right. You know, yeah, I can just thing. like let it all fly. Okay. So as we start to wrap up, I want to talk about the financial aspect, particularly as it pertains to uh, prescription medication. Last year, you were in DC at Lafayette Park attending a rally for the Alzheimer's Impact Movement or AIM. Uh, for short. Mm -hmm. This was the first time the Alzheimer's Association had a rally outside the White House. And the way you described it was, and I I wrote it down like word for word because I wanted to get it right. And it was interesting. The way you described it was that Medicare covers every single FDA approved medication with the exception of a highly promising Alzheimer's drug. And you were explaining how if Medicare doesn't cover it, that means... um, If Medicare doesn't cover it, that means the Veterans Administration won't cover it, which means Kaiser won't cover it and on and on. So you were in D.C. requesting that that legislators reverse this decision. For those who don't know, can you talk a little bit about this and why uh, wouldn't they cover it and what was the outcome? So let's see. There are two and a half, basically. There's two current Alzheimer's drugs. One of them is in use more than the other one. Both of them were initially approved in a fast track process, which I don't know. They don't the FDA and those people don't do anything quickly, so fast track doesn't seem bad to me. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. Um, again, not science based knowledge here. And because it was fast tracked, and because it's really expensive, they were just like, "Yep, yeah, we're not going to cover it." And so, fortunately, the Veterans Administration. So this was March of 2023. We were in. Um, so every year, the Alzheimer's Association has what they call their forum days. It's essentially where you go harass your legislators to pay attention to these important topics mm. outlined by the Alzheimer's Association. And the Alzheimer's Association is, they're like kings of making bipartisan oh, good. proof. Yeah. It's like, there's a, re- they have, they used, I think during the 2020 election, they had actually commercials where like, you know, the blue would come into the middle and the red would come in the middle and purple. Like one thing they and it's agree. Like, you know, and, and it's like, okay. For those who don't know, purple is the color for Alzheimer's disease. Correct. And okay. not, not yeah. that any, I'm wearing and, magenta, so I'm close. We really should have. <laughs> I didn't even think about it. Anyway, sorry, continue. Um, I mean, it doesn't matter. You know, you could be super liberal, super conservative. This disease affects everybody. It does. Yeah. And it's already affecting our economy. That is an entirely other episode we can do some other time. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they're very good at at structuring their legislative asks to be bipartisan friendly and they generally get bipartisan um, Mm buy-in so you know i guess that's good yeah um so that was what we were doing in march we had this rally to basically try to put pressure on cms which is the center for medicare services medicare and medicaid um again i've learned a lot of things i didn't need to know Mm -hmm. (laughs) and so this was in march the veterans administration i do believe sometime in april decided they would cover it and then in July, Lakembi, which is also known, that's the brand name. It's The drug's name is Lecanemab. It is mm-hmm. a monoclonal antibody mm-hmm. um, infusion okay. that clears the plaques, plaques and the tangles out of your brain. Yeah. So it got full FDA approval in July of 23. In January of 24 is when Medicare started covering it. Oh, good. And I've been in um, forums with local hospital systems like Sutter and UC Davis and Kaiser. And, you know, we kind of think, okay, it's covered. Click, you know, Mm -hmm. we can go and we're diagnosed, which that can take a long time. And now we can get this drug. Well, they have to set up an entire protocol system. The infusion clinics are generally set aside for um, cancer patients. Um, My daughter has um, Crohn's disease. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) this is how I know about, um, about, infusion clinics because that's where she goes for her medication 
and it's twice a week. It has to be in person. They're hoping with the the latest, the third drug, which for some reason has been delayed. Nobody is explaining why. Um, they're all they all work kind of the same, so I'm not really sure why we keep getting new versions, but each one seems to get better. So I guess that's good. Mm -hmm. um, the one major concern is that it can cause a brain bleed, which we've discussed is really not good for you. Yeah. Um, so they have to do multiple MRIs and they have to track you, but they're hoping that they can get to the point where they can either um, give the person the infusions at home or have them come into the hospital system less. But it's like, it's not just push a button and your doctor says, okay, you're a good candidate for this drug. Go, you know, go get your yeah. infusion. It's like a whole, right. they got to recreate the entire wheel. Yeah. Do you happen to know, is there a share of cost with like hmm. Medicare? I don't know or, that. Because I know it's highly expensive. Yeah, it's about $21,000 a month. Yeah. The good thing is, is that it generally after 18 months, the um, plaques and tangles have been cleared. Mm -hmm. You have a noticeable decrease in progression. Which I'm not even sure that's proper grammar. but That sounds right to me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it makes um, sense. Um, and so you can stop until you start noticing Okay, I'm slipping a little. So just to uh, that question, so do you feel like going to D.C. and doing this, like, did that really put pressure on them? And, and do you feel like that's why you got the results that you did? I'm sure it didn't hurt. Yeah. Um, it was the first rally the Alzheimer's Association's ever done, so that's or at least in it's D.C. It's a big deal. Yeah, yeah so um, every year they, they've increased the um, research funding for the Alzheimer's Association, so... You know, the government is not unaware of this issue. I think they'd like to be like the rest of us. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think it didn't hurt. It didn't I don't hurt. I don't know if it if it swayed them or not. Yeah. I mean, do they ever? Well, I, I mean, I know nothing about nothing, but I would imagine <laughs> that the more noise you make, the more the public becomes aware of it. And the more the public becomes aware of something, the more they have to sort of acknowledge acknowledge it. its exist. Yeah. And so if that's all you know with the what we're doing with like the walks that we do because you know we did the walk this year and like the different things it's just making it's just creating an awareness and i think the larger that awareness becomes the more they have to take a look at it and what they're doing so i think for the most part if you have not if you do not have not actually been dealing with this issue you probably will and you may have already dealt with somebody with Alzheimer's or some other dementia causing disease and not known it. Mm -hmm. Like my mom and I were leaving the public library. I used to take her out to visits wherever we could go watch children. Mm -hmm. We were the creepy old ladies stalking on kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Aww. it was a rainy day. So I'm like, let's go to the, the public library. Thankfully, there was a set of cute little like two year old twins. My mom was enthralled. I could read my own stuff. It was great. But as we're leaving, there was a couple of women, one of which was pretty young probably in her early to mid 20s um sharing their religious materials mm -hmm. my mom looks at the younger gal and mumbles something very strange mm -hmm. and the poor girl is like did i hear that correctly what did that woman say you could just see like complete confusion on the poor girl's face and i just turned around and said mouthed it mostly so my mom couldn't hear not that i think my mom really ever understood when i said this but i'm like she has Alzheimer's disease. Mm. And so I hope that helped this girl because, mm -hmm. you know, at that point, my mom wasn't combing her hair the way she used to. She wasn't wearing makeup anymore. So she kind of looked a little scruffy. Mm -hmm. um, she was always dressed fine. Um, but a lot of her clothes were too big because I couldn't get her to accept new clothes because they weren't familiar. It's really frustrating. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was a load of fun. It's like wow. your size 12 pants do not fit your size four butt. Oh, no. And, you know... <laughs> Oh, I gosh. buy you new clothes and you give them away. It's like enough to make you want to scream. Yeah. So, you know, oh. what I think people are not aware of is how prevalent this disease is in any dementia causing disease. Alzheimer's in California is the number three cause of death, more so than wow. prostate and breast cancer put together. No kidding. Yep. Oh, my. I did it was not number know that. two for a while that. and then COVID kicked us down. Oh, goodness. Um. So, you know, getting educated, <sighs> learning about the disease, learning good caregiver practices. Yeah. You know, even if it's not in your immediate family, you know, maybe it's your neighbor. Maybe yeah. it's maybe it's a coworker's parent. You now you can help support the coworker because this is a very drawn out, very physically, emotionally, financially 
spiritually draining disease. Mm -hmm. And we need to be able to support each other. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I would like to think that, you know, the United States of America is going to rally behind our older adults and just, you Mm -hmm. know, do everything we need to do to to be a strong, capable country. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that what happens is, is like, you know, again, I want to go back to my podcast, but it's like they lose their humanity in the eyes of so many people Mm -hmm. as they get older because they're usefulness has diminished worn out yeah Yeah. whatever not in the eyes of so many of the pub whatever so um we would hope that we would all rally together because this person has given 80 years or whatever it is and um they deserve to be taken care of on the back end Mm -hmm. and they are a human being and i think to stop treating them like that is you know criminal so but like what you just said about like your mom in the pants and things like that, when they do stop do it, like taking care of themselves in ways and not having the pride in their um, in their grooming or their or whatever. And they start to become sort of a shell of themselves. So it would be so easy to just go to write off, you know, but I think um not restoring, but sort of continuing their dignity on for them, on behalf of them. Like you always say, pluck your chin or whatever you want me to do, pluck your chin hairs, or <laughs> I don't know what you say. Make sure you get this or whatever. You know, you you step in and you take care of those things. Um, you also you know. pick your battles. So as I mentioned, my a lot of my mom's clothes were a little big mm-hmm. and we were leaving and her blouse slipped a little bit off her shoulder and it must have caught me out of the corner of my eye because I glanced over and I remember thinking, huh, I wonder whose black sports bra that is. Oh, Lord. And, you know, my first instinct is, oh, my God, we need to change it. My mom would never wear something. Like, but blah, 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 blah. your brain is just going. And yeah. I'm like, she's clean. She's dressed appropriately. We're leaving. Yeah. You know, people listening might think, well, that's kind of creepy. You know, like, why would you let her wear some stranger's bra? And it's like, because she was no one's happy. No going to see it. Can you imagine the battle of trying to get my mom's yeah, blouse no. off her and wrestle a sports bra off a 70 yeah. something odd year old lady no thanks yeah i have a hard time getting them off myself <laughs> pick and choose your paddle yeah special. so it's just you know oh, maintaining her humanity was not choosing not to make a fuss okay so as we close i want to thank you guys both for being here um i'm going to leave a link to your podcast in the show notes website instagram um for anybody who wants to learn more um, anything else you want me to link? Like if there's um, a book, I know we've talked about a couple or something like that, that you think, just let me know. And I can link those things to um, everybody that's an author. That's also a guest. Their books are linked in my episode. In your notes. Episodes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you're on, and I will put this in the show notes too. You're on YouTube and on all the major audio platforms. Yep. Um, okay. So this has been a true eye opener, hopefully for the listeners as well. With that said, thanks so much again for being here, you guys. Thanks for everyone for listening, and we will see you back here next week. Bye. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.